If you love Jesus, you're going to love this finale to Zechariah today. Here we go, chapter 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Pause. This is the day of the Lord, the time when God's wrath will be released on all who chose to reject him. The very last days of the last days. Verse 3. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. I mean, this is going to be amazing. All right, so the Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus ascended into heaven after his first advent mentioned in Acts chapter 1. Also in Ezekiel chapter 11, God's glory departed from Jerusalem at a mountain east of Jerusalem. Just as the Lord has fought for his people in the past in a variety of ways, including the event at the Red Sea, so he will personally intervene to fight for his people at this great battle. Next, we read that this event will cause the land to split and form a valley. Azel is an unknown location through which the remnant of the Jews will flee. This could be the valley of Jehoshaphat, Joel discussed in Joel chapter 3, where God will judge the Gentiles. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time, there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name, the only one. Pause. Likely matching the stream that will flow from the millennial temple that we read about in Ezekiel, God will cause a spring of water to spring to flow toward the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea out of Jerusalem. This will display to all who the source of life is. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimon south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. People will live in it, and there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Pause. Goodbye, terrible days of old. Hello, millennial kingdom. Verse 12. Now this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will rot in their mouth. I think I'll take the free gift of Christ and pass on that one. It will come about in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them, and they will seize one another's hand, and the hand of one will be lifted against the hand of another. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered, gold and silver and garments in great abundance. So also like this plague will be the plague on the horse, the mule, the camel, the donkey, and all the cattle that will be in those camps. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Pause. This is a very important passage stating that some Gentiles will go into the millennial kingdom alive along with the redeemed remnant of Jews, which we've discussed before. Tragically, as the thousand years go on, there will be many people from all over the world who will reject Christ as Savior and King again. 
joining in a final war against him, only to be destroyed and cast into hell forever, as is stated in Revelation chapter 20. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Pause. The Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, was God's way of reminding Israelites in every generation of their deliverance by God from Egypt. It was also a reminder that God fulfills his promise to deliver his people from the bondage of sin and their enemies. In the millennium, it will celebrate Messiah's presence again dwelling among his people and the joyful restoration of Israel, including the ingathering of the nations. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, Holy to the Lord. And the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. And all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. Pause. If you want more detail on the reason for sacrifice during the millennium, you can reference my video on Ezekiel chapter 40 from my website, which will be listed at the end of this video. For tonight's saintly snippet, I went back to Dr. John MacArthur because he had such a great, concise summary of what I want to discuss today. But I want you to know that I also referenced Got Questions, Karm, Answers in Genesis, as well as several commentaries that I have on my bookshelf. And all are in agreement with the same conclusion, as am I because of multiple available scriptures on the topic, many of which I will mention in the reading. So the question is, is it possible for the redeemed to lose their salvation? The Bible says, no. One who is saved has everlasting life and is passed from death unto life. John chapter five, verse 24. Eternal life by definition cannot be temporary. It is the present possession of all those who have truly trusted Christ. Romans chapter 8 verses 28 through 39 reveals clearly that there is nothing in the universe that can separate the elect from the love of God. The one who chose to save you is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Jude verse 24. According to scripture, People who profess to know Christ at one time, but later deny him, were never really saved to begin with. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, in order that it might be shown that they all are not of us. A true believer will never depart from the faith. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. So those who do so are revealing that they were never truly saved. Reference John chapter 8, verse 31, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. True Christians can sin, however, and because of that may lack assurance of salvation. A failure to grow spiritually can also rob us of the confidence that we are God's children. But anyone indwelt by the Holy Spirit is secure eternally because he is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. And something that I heard years ago that I completely agree with is that if it were up to us humans to lose our salvation, we all would. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for granting us true believers your divine, infinite, and eternal righteousness so that we are made fit for your presence forever. For those of us who have received your righteousness, may we live daily with grateful hearts for a gift so undeserved. For others, Lord, who are still trying to deal with their sin on their own, we ask that you would show them clearly that by their deeds they will not be justified, they will not be right with you, and that it can only happen through true faith and surrender to you. 
We ask that those we love and know that are not yet fit for your kingdom, that they will be made right with you and be able to face death with certainty of everlasting glory in your name. Help us, Lord, who have been freed from sin to listen no longer to its voice, knowing that we are now under your leadership by grace through righteousness to holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless your day. Have a good one. Thank you for being here.